We're pleased to welcome people back both in person in our annex here at the library and on Zoom to the second in our autumn series of Invisible Histories talks. Our talks are free, but we do of course welcome donations and there's a donate button on our website. Harry Taylor is with us today to talk about his decade researching the life and politics of Victor Grayson, most often remembered for winning a remarkable by-election at Colne Valley in 1907 and for his still unexplained disappearance in 1920. I'm going to share our screen now so that we can see the slides. Harry, thanks, over to you. Well, thank you everybody, first of all, for, for coming today. So it's a great honor to be here. And I should say thank you first to, to the working class member library and the staff, because I actually did some of the research here and spent a couple of days writing here. And the, the library kindly let me use a photograph as well from one of Grayson's elections, which I've reproduced in the book, which has been published before. So thank you for that. I thought what we'd do today is look at kind of reappraise Victor's life through looking at three key moments in his life, probably key moments of his history, and see how the historical, what's been accepted as historical fact, differs from the actual facts, and how that has affected our view of Grayson looking back in history. So, if I could have the next slide, please. So, why Victor Grayson? Um, I'll, I'll just start off with this, it kind of gives you a, a, a taste of, of how I've come to this subject. Uh, I was researching a paper on Hugh Gatesfield, uh, when I was a student at Queen University, and there was a book on Gatesfield called Read and Lust. And I couldn't find it, it wasn't there. But next door to that book was Labour's Lost Leader by David Clark. So my first thought was how many damn lost leaders of the Labour Party have. <laughs> Uh, but secondly, it was quite a single volume. I thought well, I could read that in a day or two. Not as, as we are students doing arts degrees, I have lots of free time on my hands when we weren't in the pub. Um, so I read it and I was absolutely captivated by it. It was an incredible story. And I thought, why haven't I heard of this man before? And I also saw a lot of parallels with what was happening in the Labour Party a century ago with what was happening now or what was happening then which was 2007, 2008, so you had the, the transition from Blair to Brown and kind of factional fights about the direction of the Labour Party. So I couldn't find any other books on Grayson. Uh, they were out of print. There wasn't much material in that I could find at the university, and, and that was that. Um, and then fast forward five years ago, uh, sorry, five years to 2012, as a diligent uh, member of the Labour Party, I was out knocking doors in November of 2012 when we had the first police and fire commissioner election. Do you remember those? The first ones that we had, which about three people voted in. And it was dark, it was cold, it was wet. And we retired the one day. I was in Warwickshire and we retired to uh, the home of a, of a member in Appleston, Warwickshire, to to dry out and to get, get something uh, warm to drink. And she was having a conversation with, a, with an elderly member about a politician that disappeared. And me, you know, being cocksure, I said, oh, do you mean John Stonehouse? Do you know that being John Stonehouse much before your time? And I said, do you mean Victor Grayson? And she said, yes, I've seen Victor Grayson. How have you heard about him? I said, oh, I read a book about him a few years ago. And she told me that her husband, who was Derek Forward, who was a former um, parliamentary candidate for Labour, I think about six occasions, a former council leader for the Labour Party, he had conducted a lot of research into Grace in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And he'd spoken to people who knew him first hand. They, they were very old at the time, but they were friends of his and people that said they were in distant relations. She gave me these papers. There was a couple of boxes of papers, and there was letters there from from Atley, from Herbert Morrison, from Victor Galantz, the, the founder of the, the uh, Left Book Club. Numerous other people that knew Grayson. There is mater election material in there, photographs, stuff that hadn't been published or seen before. And so I kind of made the decision there to 
instead of just donating to an archive and to greenly use it to, to write and something about racism because he wasn't particularly interested in me so much. So I decided to start writing a biography of him, which is harder than it sounds because racism did not leave an archive. So you cannot go to a university or a, even the English History Museum will come here to look at the, the integration papers because they're simply archived. Not in one archive. You have to hunt literally the world to find anything. So you have to rely on the memoirs, which are long out of print, surviving letters, which are scattered around the globe. An interesting grace of not long. Ago. Excuse me, excuse me. I'm sorry to interrupt, and I'm probably very bad, but I cannot hear properly because uh, I don't know where you're speaking, but you are not speaking clearly. It's not the height of the depth of the sound. It's it's a bit blurred. I don't know whether it's just me and my equipment or whether it's generally for those of us who are on Zoom. Please would somebody who's clever yes. look at it. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you very much. We, we, we go, we're just moving the speaker up. Um, Can you hear me now? That's a bit better. It isn't the level of your sound. It was the clarity of your enunciation. Thank you. <laughs> I, I gather that there's, we, we've had comments on the chat which I haven't been able to access. So uh, we've just been told that it is hard for people on Zoom to hear. Apologies. We've just moved the speaker across nearer to the microphone and we're going to do it from there. Well, what do you say Thank to that? <laughs> a regional accent. Um, sorry about that, folks. Uh, I hope you can hear much better now on Zoom. I'm the only one that does uh, what I was getting at was that there was no sole grace in archives. So you have to rely on memoirs, which are usually long out of print, letters which are scattered around universities. There's some I've published in the book, which are in Illinois, of all places. Um, sadly, not much in Manchester. The other point about Grayson is, and this is one of my key issues, that Labour history has been written by Grayson's detractors, or certainly by people that, that thought he was either useless or saw him as a threat. So I don't think he's had a fair hearing um, from historians. So I thought what we do today is to go through three instances of what has become accepted truth uh, in the history of Grayson, and look at that actually comparing it to the facts. So, what does it actually say in contemporary newspapers? What does it say in those letters uh, that Grayson wrote himself? And what does it say in books written at the time, not what has been written 40, 50, 60 years later? So, the first of these is Grayson was high born. So, you might know the, the story. Uh, Grayson is supposedly a illegitimate member of the Marlborough family. Someone even reported that he was a half-brother of Winston Churchill. And this was based on rumour to start with. So in the first biography of Grayson, uh, written by Reg Rose, he, he gives this story that there were rumours that Grayson was actually illegitimate because surely someone that looked so good who could speak so well and was so presentable? Must... If you want to carry on, yeah. I'm just going to try and make the colours. I chose that picture because here he's very smart, he's got his Edwardian colour on. The nice carved chair. Surely this guy couldn't have come from the sons of Liverpool. Surely he must have blue blood in him. So Grove states this uh, in his first biography, which Grayson's sister, Augusta, reads and then threatens to sue Groves because she says it's absolutely outlandish. But she doesn't have the finances to actually prosecute. Okay. Forward that slightly. So it remains, the, the accusation remains. David Clark, in his biography, repeats it, but David does go and find Victor's birth certificate. And Victor's birth certificate is marked with a cross where his mother's name should be. And it simply says, the mark of Elizabeth Grayson. So surely that's proof because Victor's mother was Scottish. 
even though she was working class, the Victorian Scottish education system was much superior to ours in England. So it was taken for granted that she must have been well educated or at least be able to, to read and write. So it must have been her religious conviction that made her put a mark on Victor's birth certificate because she couldn't bring herself to tell a lie. So she must have just marked it with a cross. So when I started researching this, I got a copy of Victor's birth certificate and then thought, well, he had seven other brothers and sisters, so let's get their birth certificates as well. Because surely if his mother was going through this kind of turmoil of lying about Victor's real uh, origins, she would have told the truth for her other children. So I had all the birth certificates arrive in the post and they're all there, marked with a cross. Which demonstrated, I think, that she was illiterate. So then I went to have a look for her birth certificate to see where she was born. She doesn't exist. Simply because in Scotland at the time, she was born, we think, three years before it became, uh, it was, you had to legally declare the birth of a child. It was usually, 90% of the time, extremely poor families that didn't register the birth of children before it was, uh, before you legally had to. So I think that was, again, busted one of the myths. You know, all these rumours have been put about usually by Grayson Venice because Grayson was well-dressed. He liked nice wine. He liked to, to go to nice places. Surely a, a working-class socialist doesn't like nice things. But Grayson did. He was born with nothing. He, he was definitely born into that working-class family. He had no shoes on his feet when he was growing up. His father was an alcoholic, out of work. The children in Grayson's family including him himself, are sent to work to the ride. So that was the first big myth. And Grayson, you know, when we talk about his politics and how he's remembered in history, this is always brought up by somebody. Oh, he's, he's Churchill's half-brother. He's one of the Marlborough family. He's not really a product of the British working class, but he is, and the facts say that he was. So the second myth... Now, Grayson's great protest in Parliament when he's thrown out of Parliament for trying to raise the issue of unemployment. It's been handed down to us by Grayson's detractors and then taken for granted that he must have been drunk when he did this. You know, why on earth would anyone protest in Parliament about the unemployed? He must have been drunk. And they've used this to say, well, Grayson was not a planner. He had no political theory behind him. He was quite whimsical about his politics. But actually, if we look back to the parliamentary session in 1908, and forgive me, I'm going to read a couple of extracts, because I think it gives you a flavour of Grayson's politics, and actually that he was performing well in the House of Commons. So 1908, second session, they're talking about an unemployment bill. So the Liberal government is, well, sorry, the bill's been put forward by the opposition and it's being debated. Now, this is how it was reported if we go back to the 13th of March, 1908. Grayson noticed consternation when the responsibilities of the government were pointed out to the Liberal benches. When they accepted office, they accepted responsibility for every social problem. And he confronted them with this problem of unemployment. He had noticed an irresistible tendency on the part of honourable members opposite to show distaste for the hateful realism of this question of unemployment. Why upset the beautiful picture that honourable members have built up for themselves? Why upset their castles of illusion that allowed them to go through life without bothering about these questions? Why bring into the view of House of Commons the haggard sight of the working, the working man whom they were meeting every day? Not many yards from the House, honourable members, were confronted every night with a problem that made them feel ashamed. Not only of having to be jointly responsible for a state of mismanagement, but the professed Christianity of their nation. This is not a man who's standing up drunk in Parliament with no kind of idea of where he's going. Grayson is quite clearly, I think, here building a picture of the difference of the, the landowning class in Parliament and in control of the country with the real state of the British working class and the unemployed situation on the streets of England. And now he goes in to give, I think, a, a classic um, kind of exposition of, of the socialist message in England. 
And he says, he's quoted, in the last 50 years, wealth has increased by miraculous leaps and bounds. And while it was endeavored to be shown that the increased wealth of the country was due to free trade, the problem remained grimly ever present through all our prosperity. It was not that they could not find work for everyone. It was that they were trying an impossible task. They were trying to lift themselves up by their bootlaces. They were trying to solve the unemployed problem while leaving vested interests alone. They were trying to find work for workers without interfering with the interests of those who had rents and position, uh, possession of wealth. It would never be done. And he did not hope that this house would do it as at present composed. It would only be done when the means of production, distribution and exchange without access to which they could not live were in the hands of the people and not in the hands of a small clique. It might, it might seem like a dream from afar, but the government persisted in their present method of flouting serious social problems. And if they continued their dispiriting criticism of serious measures, which might have faults, but which contain vital principles, then socialism would not be so much a dream as it seemed at the present moment. And the ineptitude and futility of the present government would be real of us. Now, Grayson is giving, uh, you know, what became Labour's, uh, from, from 1918, one of Labour's core principles, Clause 4. You know, the workers should own by hand and by brain production, distribution, exchange of goods in the economy. Then Grayson moves on to his anti-poverty crusade. So remember that as the background. We're told that what he's going to come is just a, a flight of fancy from a drunkard. There's been no prior planning. But Grayson moves on now to his anti-poverty crusade, which takes place just a few streets away from here. And there's Robert Blatchford there, there's the Clarion movement there, there's Margaret Bondfield there, and there's McDonald's first Labour government. And at this meeting, they declare war on unemployment. <coughs> they put forward Grayson's programme, essentially, and the Clarion programme. And Grayson gets up and says he's going to Parliament in the next session. Whatever the discussion is on, he's going to raise the issue of unemployment again. Whether people want him to or not, he's going there to do this. To highlight it, it's going to be the, the starting gun on a UK-wide um, anti-poverty crusade. So he goes to Parliament, back to Parliament when the third session starts that year in 1908. There's a licensing bill being debated of all things when there's serious problems going on in the country that the Commons is spending days debating this bill. And Grayson walks coolly into the, the Commons chamber, carrying his hat, and he sits down, crosses his leg, and he listens. He tries to get the speaker's attention. He doesn't want to give him Grayson. He doesn't want to give his attention to Grayson. Grayson jumps up, and he starts his protest, which he's spoken about. And he ends up by, if I read a bit more, I mean, this is where he really breaks from the Labour Party. Um, and he, he goes for, for fellow members of the party. He says, that dignified assembly is composed of 670 members of Parliament, mostly capitalists. Their good-humoured complacent apathy is hardly their fault. They have never lived near enough to the heart of humanity to feel its beat. They have never trapped the hard bad boots unwanted by civilization. What do they want? What do they know? What can they know of the haunting spectre that tracks every step of the luckless worker? He's asked to sit down and shut up and to go away quietly, which after calling his uh, Labour colleagues traitors to their class, which you can imagine they're all very happy to hear, Grayson walks out of the chamber. But he goes back the following day when they're still debating the license. And he goes in again, coolly. No one reports, by the way, at the time that he's worse for drink. Absolutely fine. He walks in, crosses his leg again. Then he jumps up, starts his protest again, and he shouts out, I leave the house, as I said yesterday, with pleasure, because I feel that no man can stay in this house another moment. 
when he's told that he's not entitled to address the House of Commons, Grayson says, well, then I leave the House, as I said before, feeling that I've gained in dignity by leaving this institution. And I hope that, and then he's being shouted down continuously, and all he's heard to say as he's leaving is, this House, this House of Commons is a house of murderers. And at that moment, I think Grayson had, had severed his links with the Parliamentary Labour Party. But if we look at how that's reported, at the time, even his detractors report it, and they don't say that Grayson's drunk. He seems, you know, quite uh, aware of or in control of his faculties and aware of his surroundings. And this is where I bring in Fenner Brockway, um, who probably doesn't need any introduction. Brockway, in his memoirs, says that he was him and other young members of the ILP were absolutely behind Grayson with his protest. They thought he was a hero. But then Keir Hardy tells Brockway, who at the time is a teetotaler, that Grayson only did it because he was drunk. And all of a sudden, because Keir Hardy, who's going to not believe what Keir Hardy says? Brockway and his friends break with Grayson over this. He, he has no other evidence of it. And he writes a letter to Derek Forward. I talked about the Forward papers. And Derek had asked him, dear Fenner, do you have any direct recollection of Victor Grayson or any memories of him? And Brockway writes back, no, I'm afraid not. I'm well aware of Grayson. I supported him, but I never met him personally and didn't spend any considerable time in his company. But then we hear in David Clark's biography, he had spoken to Brockway after Brockway had written his memoirs, and Fenner Brockway had told David Clark that actually he had been to visit Grayson, that Grayson was clearly the worst for wear for drink during the time of this protest that was made in Parliament, and then it was taken as fact. So what Brockway had said to Clark was then repeated and repeated and repeated, and it's then taken as fact that this actually a quite brave protest and part of a bigger scheme of protest for the socialist movement was simply done on a whim by a drunkard who had spent too much time in the parliamentary bar. And that's one of the dangers, I think, of, of history, that rumours are uh, printed and become taken as fact and then reported as fact and reported and reported and reported. And because Grayson didn't write his memoirs, he started but didn't finish, they were never published, and because, as I said, history has been written largely by his detractors, this has been forgotten. And this myth has been built up by Grayson. And that's, that's the second one, um, second instance, I think, where we need to reappraise. I think the book does reappraise um, what Grayson is doing. The third one is that Maundy Gregory murdered Victor Grayson. I think this is probably... Um, for, for some people, the most interesting aspect of Grayson's life. It's certainly the, the most known by people that aren't, uh, aren't into Grayson, so to speak. It's a theory that's been repeated in television documentaries. Uh, I think it was Andrew Mars, Making of Modern Britain. He talks about Victor Grayson being murdered by Maudie Gregory. Um, but this all comes from one book, and it's a book that comes out in 1970 called Murder by Perfection by an author called Donald McCormick, who must surely be trustworthy because he was the foreign correspondent for the Sunday Times. So surely he's trustworthy. Gregory writes, sorry, uh, McCormick writes in this book that Gregory had been tasked with following Grayson because Grayson had come out of the First World War and he was a dangerous left-wing revolutionary. So the government was spying on Grayson to make sure that he wasn't going to try and overthrow the government like Lenin and Trotsky had in Russia. And then Grayson finds out that uh, Gregory is selling honours on behalf of Lloyd George, raising money for the Liberals and the Tories, and that Gregory bumps him off. And in the book, McCormick has all these wonderful sources, and he says, oh, yes, well, uh, there was a private Adams there who saw what was going on. He was a contemporary of Grayson's in the New Zealand forces, and he witnessed Grayson being followed and all this, this murky stuff. No private Adams has ever been found. David Clark 
look for him, I look for him. There's no record of this particular private Adam. The next piece of information is from a, from a painter, Flemwell, who is apparently sat painting on the Thames and he sees this electric canoe go past with Victor Grayson in, funnily enough. And the canoe pulls up at Maundy Gregory's girlfriend's house and Grayson jumps out, goes through the door, but he never comes out of it. And this painter is supposedly goes to the house, knocks the door and says, oh, is Victor there? Oh no, never heard of him. Must have been bumped off. But it turns out McCormick was a fool. He wrote something in the range of 53 books in 15 years. Some of them erotic novels, some of them on UFOs, ancient Egypt, aliens, anything you can think of, ghosts, uh, Jack the Ripper as well. And in every single one of his books, he managed to find documents and evidence that no one else has ever found or ever been able to see. His entire story about Grayson, he gives all these great names, and he'd spoken to Robert Blatchford about it when he was 12 years old. I mean, Blatchford had been dead for 30 odd years when this book came out. He was a fraudster, but it's been taken as fact. So Reg Groves, first in his second biography, accepts this story and goes with it, even though, as I explained in this book, I think Groves actually found out what happened to Grayson. But nevertheless, he accepts this story, probably to sell books. Uh, it's taken as fact then. No one else looks back into it. David Clark accepts the, uh, the Maundy Gregory theory, although he does have the caveats that it's funny this, because this Donald McCormick, lovely guy, he won't let me look at any, any of his evidence he's got. But nevertheless, so McCormick has since been revealed as a serial fraudster. So that made me go back into the, the archives and see what was really going on. So in the National Archives, there was a, a shadowy organisation called the National War Aims Committee. And they were tasked with putting pro-war uh, propaganda out into the country, speaking tours of, of pro-war individuals to, to make sure that industry kept working for the war effort and that men kept signing up and there was no strikes. Because we've got to keep strikes down to a minimum. And actually, far be it from, uh, you know, McCormick talks about Grayson being his left-wing threat. Actually, he's working for the government. There's letters in the archives, in the National Archives, signed by Lloyd George's secretary. They come from 10 Downing Street, asking Grayson to tour the country. Can you go up to Huddersfield? Can you go up to Clydeside and speak to the, the ship workers? Can you go to this pit here in Barry and Furness? And, because there's the, the unions are, are looking a bit shaky. We think they're going to strike. We need to go up there and persuade them of the message. And Grayson's message was, it's far easier to build socialism in Britain in a parliamentary democracy than it is under the jackboot of the Kaiser. So Grayson is in the pay of the British government. He's being sent all around the country. But he then disappears, doesn't he, uh, in 1920. And just before that, he retreats from, from public view. And we're told that he retreats from public view because Gregory's onto him or trying to blackmail him. So I went through, there's, there's sheets of receipts of money that Grayson was receiving in the archives as well. And the simple reason that Grayson retreated, I think, from public view is that he was paid five pounds then for a public appearance or he was paid a pound for 500 words to write a leaflet. Sorry, the other way around, you've given five pounds to write a leaflet or a pound for a public appearance, which is a great deal of money then. So what would you do? I mean, Grayson was a man, he didn't have much money, he went into the war poor, came out of it poorer, lost his wife, lost his daughter. Now, if you want to get yourself back on your feet, it seems to me you'd stay at home in some quite nice surroundings he had a nice uh, block of flats in London, you would stay there and you would write. Send your articles off. Get your money back up. So again, I've, I've deviated slightly, but this is, you know, the truth is stranger, I think, than fiction. But it's another example of how, you know, the history and our view of Grayson has been totally tainted um, by people that have frankly made things up. So... We haven't 100% solved what happened to Grayson. 
but we are, we can, you know, we know his movements right up to the point that he disappeared. We know who he was talking with. We know what he was doing. We now know, as I've said, his early years, we know he wasn't uh, some illegitimate child of Randall Churchill. We know that he wasn't drunk in Parliament. He had a drink problem, of course. We know that. He liked to drink, but so do a lot of parliamentarians, if we're frank about it. So this is how Grayson, I think, our view of him has been warped, and I hope that this book is going some way to put that right. So that's it. Oh, okay. I'm going to. Oops. Lady could make out what I was saying. I'm just going to stop the <laughs> share. Ah, <laughs> oh, funny enough, she's a teacher. <laughs> um, right, folks, I am um, back, and I'm about to take questions or comments originally, uh, or initially from from in the, in the annex here. Um, and then I'm, uh, and, and then I'll turn to, to our Zoomers. So do get ready for uh, Zoomers for thinking about talk, uh, questions. And if you could put them in the chat, that, that might be great. Okay, um, Ralph. Uh, thank you, Ari. Um, I wonder if you could sort of elaborate a bit more about what I think was a sort of you know, central tension between raising this this flamboyant you know, remarkable speaker, orator, and sort of inspired individual, and uh, organization and agency. And uh, in a sense, you know, we are really thoroughly into the world, but there are three potential uh, social agencies the Labour Party or the ILG. And in a sense, you can be spoken about that part of that uh, all of the way in which this is connected with the role of the Labour Party in Parliament and the ineffection of the Parliament to be the social change uh, and, and burn these bridges with them. I mean, part of it is also attacked by that, it's not just sort of you know, one way through. Now, the other two tenants, which I wasn't that you might want to say to me about, are the, the project for a new socialist party, which you would say is a, a leading out, and in which indeed get off the ground in some form uh, as the representative party. But then the, the problem of the, the main group in that, the demographic generation, the tenth of the regard. And, and you know, uh, unfortunately, that's a project which doesn't take shape, but which would have allowed Grace's ideas to have the sort of organizational. Yeah. Traction, um, you know, and, and I think it would be good for you to be put together. But the other tension is the role of the Labour and the Mass, because, you know, from my point of view, there's an enormous wave of mass school. And again, I'm wondering to what extent Grace and identified not just in terms of rhetorical appeal, but, but in terms of practical connection and with those struggles. In, in the sense that here was a, an alternative social course is about the things that she aspired to direct action, anti parliamentary, all the struggle, and so on. And yet, there appears there, 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 there to be a tension between his individual role and that potential social Ralph, what I should have said was that it's hard for people on Zoom to hear the questions in the hall. So, what I'm going to do is ask Harry if he can, in answering that, kind of summarize what the question was that you're answering. I'll also turn this around so that um, at the risk of you being seasick Zoomers, I think this is gonna be better for, for you to be able to see Harry, but also hear him. Can you hear me okay on Zoom? Is that great, thanks everybody. And thanks for sitting through that as well. Um, well, great questions. Um, should we start with the British Socialist Party? So, Part of Grayson's message once he gets into, into Parliament, uh, and with his great friend Robert Blatchford as well, who's editor of the Clarion, is a movement for socialist unity. So he wants there to be one core grouping of socialists, initially in the Labour Party, to kind of carry out the socialist message. Now, Grayson falls out with the Labour Party because the Labour Party, under Hardy and MacDonald and Snowden, 
very much believes in the parliamentary road, the incremental road to socialism. And don't forget that one of the major um, parts of the party is the trade union movement. Now, people my age tend to look back at the trade union movement as surely it must have been radical from the beginning, they were radical socialist organisations. But if you look back to Grayson's time, they weren't. They were very often liberal supporting or even Tory supporting organisations. Even though some of the members could have been socialist in their views, the leadership was generally quite small C conservative. So when Grayson has his protest and he's thrown out of parliament, he starts touring the country, calling for a new socialist party. And then when he loses his seat in Colne Valley in 1910, the first of the 1910 general elections, he ups the ante for a new socialist party. And he wants to unite all these disparate left-wing groups. And you mentioned the SDF, but there's others as well. Um, Marxist, socialist, a few cooperators, even some anarchists. He wants to bring them all together into this British Socialist Party, which is formed mainly because of Grayson's effort and around Grayson as the principal leader in uh, 1912. But Grayson's inexperience gets the better of him. The leaders of the SDF, Henry Hyman in particular, I think it's Harry Quelch as well, they undermine him. And before he knows it, Grayson realises that even though the, the ex, everyone had accepted that their own organisations were going to be diluted and everything put into the British Socialist Party, he realises that the British Socialist Party is formed without the Social Democratic Federation, the SDF, dissolving their party. The SDF take total control of the British Socialist Party and they freed Grayson out of it. So they've used him, essentially, to um, propagandise on, on uh, behalf of this new party, used his appeal to bring in members. And I, I put in the book, you know, lots of names that we know now, like John McLean, um, people that joined the, the British Socialist Party did so because of Grayson. And yet he was, he was shut out of it. So I think that's an example of him not having the experience, the backroom experience, not having the scars on his back. Anyone that's been a member of committees knows that they can go on for hours sometimes. And it, Grayson just didn't have the patience. Although he, he was a planner, he didn't have the patience when it came to these really old school left-wingers. Uh, with the labour unrest, yes, Grayson did identify with it. I think if you, you look back to the newspapers, 1910, 1911, Grayson's there with them. He's speaking on behalf of them. When Tom Mann is locked up, Grayson, even, he's raised in Parliament that Grayson is almost goading the government to have him locked up because Grayson is filling in for Tom Mann when Tom should be speaking. And he's brought up in Parliament by a Liberal MP that we can't arrest Grayson, even though what he's doing, we should lock him up. We can't because it will cause a huge backlash against us and will actually drive more people to the socialist movement. But Grayson, the interesting thing is, after the war, and this is what really makes a mockery of Donald McCormick's view of Grayson being this uh, dangerous Marxist. 1918, especially 1919, this country comes closer to revolution than it ever has been, and ever has been since. And what's Grayson doing at that time? He's not on the barricades, he's not leading strikes. He's actually writing pro-government propaganda, supporting the government, because Grayson is a socialist, an English socialist, in the sense of Robert Blatchford, William Morris, and Edward Carpenter. He's not a Bolshevik. And I think I was talking to, to you earlier, sir, about Lenin's comment about Grayson being a man of no principles, fiery rhetoric, no principles. And Grayson was not a Bolshevik. And I think that he saw that tendency creeping into the British socialist movement, uh, labour movement, and uh, he was aghast. So I think, does that answer? Thank you. Right. OK, so Steve, if you could uh, tell, yes, tell us your question, but I think, Harry, if you can summarise it yeah. for our Zoomers, that would be great. A couple of practical questions. You mentioned there's another person. What about his father's? Yeah. And secondly, was the Jim Hansen before his speeches 
in protest in the house on two occasions. So I mentioned, thank, thanks for the question, Steve. So I mentioned his mother's birth certificate. Quite rightly, you say, what about his father's? Um, yes, it does exist. Um, I'll, I'll put it in there. His father was born son of a carpenter in Yorkshire, South Yorkshire. And he's a bit of a wayward from the start. So he doesn't really settle down to work, doesn't like school, ends up signing up for the army, gets shipped to Ireland, which is where he meets uh, Grayson's mother, I think because she's working in service in Ireland. And he finds himself always in prison, uh, the, the equivalent of army prison, because he just does not do what he's told. If he goes off on leave, he doesn't come back. He's always drinking, um, which obviously passed on that to his son, I expect. And then he's supposed to go to India. They're supposed to be shipped out from Southern Ireland to go to India. And he never shows up, he absconds. And his name is William Dickinson. That's how he was born. He moves, he gets, he, I don't know how he gets to Liverpool, but I expect he just jumps on a ship with false papers or hides himself on there to get to Liverpool. And he emerges as William Grayson. Um, so he was quite a character in himself. Um, what was the second question now? Hansard. Ah, Hansard, yes, Hansard, I've recorded his speeches. Um, there's only small sections of them, though, mainly because, and they don't put this in Hansard, that large sections couldn't be heard by the recorder, apparently, because of the, the, the shouts and the cries uh, towards him, which is why in the book I've gone towards uh, some of the journalists that were there, because they recorded what was being shouted at Grayson, um, and, and they seem to have recorded some of it slightly better. So that, that's why. Oh, do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks very much for that, Mary. You're a fascinating. I'd love to see a, a discussion between yourself and David Clark. You know, yeah. Several things on, yeah. on race. And I think what you seem to be saying doesn't contradict David Clark. It clarifies some things and builds on it, which is what a good history should be about. Um, I suppose. This is a bit of a sort of a rambling sort of question, but as somebody who lived in the cold now for 20 years and did slack work, so people sometimes get confused as to where it's a when you come when I'm sure. Uh, it's actually this side of the industry of slack work now as the gold. Um, when I was there, I certainly in the early to encounter, I still come across people who knew people. Who knew Victor Grayson? And he was absolutely not the right in the way that very, very few people in the world who knew him could have been. He went to the other place, he was equivalent to that in the whole battle. And look, in that thing in general, he was absolutely idolized and people loved him. And he was a show, and you know, there was lots of things in David Clark's books where he did full flow. And then, you know, in terms of the women in the audience, he saw a lady told me, like, I knew her, and things like that. So, and he'd get away with it. And I think one of the, the issues with Keir Hardy and Philip Smalley, which turned him against him, was, was jealousy. It's quite a lot of women in jealousy, you know, they were invented the, the adulation that the creation had for them to be interested in your thoughts on that and you know, what you, you come across. Well, I think the first point is that I couldn't have done this book without David Clark yeah. because, you know, on a very basic point, it was reading David's book that got me onto the subject. Mm -hmm. but secondly, David has been fantastic. You know, I've mm -hmm. we've shared information. When David did his last book, I shared some of the information I had. Um, he's done the same for me. He's read it for me. Um, it's been quite exciting, actually, because... To, to share things that I found out subsequently and say to David, oh, look at this, this is brilliant. And he's like, oh, great, you know, you've know, got to get it published. So David is, you know, this, I say in the acknowledgements, this is very much standing on the shoulders of giants, if you like. Um, so I do owe David a lot. And I, I, I think you're right that nothing I've written really contradicts uh, what David has written. A lot of David's work, he kind of asks questions. And he says, well, this is what's been done on the McCormick stuff. He says, well, this is the story. 
it doesn't really seem right. Uh, or the, the stuff about him being a, a Marlborough, and he, he's saying, well, you know, I've been told this, but uh, it doesn't fit right, but there are similarities between him and Churchill. So I think what I've done is to actually follow those leads and to clear up some of those questions that David raises. And I like to see this as kind of us getting a couple of steps further down the road to really get in the, the, the real picture of Grace and the man. You talk about Hardy and Snowden. Was it jealousy? Uh, in short, I think yes. Um, Ramsey McDonald as well, I'd add to that. I mean, McDonald, if you go back to the, the letters that are in the uh, People's History Museum around Grace and selection, because one of the big furores was that Keir Hardy and Ramsey McDonald wanted to drop or parachute in one of their colleagues into the Carl Valley, whereas the members wanted Grace. And even when they've been told you can't have Grayson, they still selected him anyway. And if you read the documents, McDonald is there saying to Grayson, don't worry, Victor, I'm on your side. I know you're good. I know the people love you. I'm doing everything I can. And then he's also writing to the NAC, which is the equivalent of today's National Executive Committee, saying we can't have Grayson. He's too young. He doesn't know anything about the movement. He's just got a big gob on him. He's got no real politics. We can't have him. So McDonald is, you know, he's a friend to no one. Snowden as well, clearly bitter. Uh, I think we see that. that he actually wanted Grace and seat and ended up as an MP for Carl Allen. And one of the stories, actually, interestingly, um, that David Clark did report in his book was a sighting from John Beckett of Grayson. And Snowden doesn't mention this, or he mentions it slightly in his memoirs, but doesn't get into the meat of it. And I, I contacted John Beckett's father, who was Francis Beckett, the broadcaster and the Guardian journalist. And Francis said, well, I've got this memoir that my dad wrote. He wrote his memoirs in the forties, never published them. Do you want them? I said, brilliant, yeah. And I was reading through. And he talks about his sighting of Grayson. So not only has he, this guy come up to them at this uh, outdoor rally and said, oh, I'm big to Grayson, not made a big deal of it and took them to the pub afterwards. And they've had a couple of drinks. And Francis Beckett's writing in here, he says, well, the guy clearly had shell shock, what we call shell shock. He talks about his experience in the New Zealand forces, talked about his father-in-law, he's a Bolton bank manager. This is stuff that wasn't known at all at the time. They knew he'd been in the forces, but didn't know the stuff shell shock or those family relations. John Beckett goes on and he says, then we went to Parliament and we went to see Philip Snowden because Snowden knew Grayson pretty well. And we spent quite a lot of time with Snowden and he wanted to know exactly every last detail about this man, what he looked like, what he spoke like, what he wore, what he talked about, his mannerisms. And John Beckett says, we came away from that meeting and Snowden was convinced that we met Victor Grayson, 100% convinced. But Snowden doesn't mention that in his memoirs that he writes a few years later. And that's for one of two reasons. One, that he kind of doesn't want to give any fuel to the, the, the uh, rumours of Victor Grayson coming back or coming back into politics. Because remember at the time, he's still younger than Ernie Bevin, who's in the Labour government. But there's the other point that John Beckett who obviously wrote the memoir, went over to the British Union of Fascists. Then he went even further and followed more Hornwall into forming a national socialist movement. So maybe it was that aspect that made Snowden not want to mention Beckett, or maybe it's because he didn't want the, the ghost of Victor Grayson to come back. But yeah, I think there's certainly jealousy there throughout the leaders of the party towards Grayson. Okay, I, I am aware that people on, on Zoom are saying that it is hard for them to, to hear the questions. We do appreciate that. Social distancing wise, logistically, we can't uh, get, us, get the questioners coming up. But uh, Harry is, is doing his, his best to summarise the question as he's doing the answer. What, uh, what I will do um, is take a question from Zoom now and, and uh, have people, if, if there are other people in the hall, think of a really pithy question, um, then, uh, then that would be great. But I, I can see that um, Frank is asking, how, Harry, do you think that Grayson died? Well, that's the big one, isn't it? Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. 
he wasn't murdered by Maundy Gregory. I think actually, and, and I've got this in the book, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence and also some physical evidence that Grayson lived out his years in Maidstone, Kent, under an assumed name. Now that's, you look at all the sightings, the sighting I've just spoken about, which was probably the most realistic sighting of him, that happened in Maidstone. Other sightings of him are all centered around Kent, Mason and London. Now there's some information in Reg Groves' archives and this is one of my bugbears with Reg Groves' why didn't he go with this instead of the McCormick story is that he interviewed the lead investigator into Grayson's disappearance during the war because there's a big investigation into Grayson's whereabouts during the Second World War which in itself is a mystery because why would you have an investigation into the man that's been missing for 20 years when uh, we're still being bombed by the Germans. But on that document, it says that Grayson remarried and lived in Kent. And I think, I mean, there's no death records, there's no burial records for an Albert Victor Grayson. I've been through everything. David Clark's been through everything. Reg Groves went through everything in Ireland or Britain. So I do believe that he lived under an assumed name and that he died probably in 1940, 1941, because that's the point when all of the sightings stop. All of the sightings in this country by people that knew him stop. And uh, that, that's my theory. Did you have access to Grayson's unfinished autobiography? Yes, I found it. Uh, he only got as far as writing the, what would you call it, um, the kind of summary, the introduction of it, and the first three chapters. But yes, I found it, and he's got this scroll that's quite hard to, hard to read, but I, I managed to, to go through it, and I've used it uh, in the book. And it does give you more of a sense of what his life was like in Manchester, uh, sorry, in Liverpool, growing up and some of the, the things he got up to. So there's a story of when he, he absconded from home and he's supposed to go to school one morning and he actually jumped on a ship and tried to get to Chile as a, as a bit of an adventure. So he gives the first-hand account of it in there. Um, so, so little things like that that give us a kind of clue as to what his life was like in Liverpool. Um, so yes, I have used it. The risk of making you seasick again. Um, if anybody else wants to type something into the chat or you can try waving at me and we can see if we can we can hear you on on, the, on Zoom. Anybody on Zoom want to wave to me? No? Okay. Is anybody else in the hall wanting to? Right, okay. At the, at the back then. The question is about public meetings and, and how many people turned up at, at, uh, at Grayson's meetings. Well, it's definitely, uh, you mentioned Jeremy Corbyn and his leadership, especially the first year or two. Phenomenal crowds of people coming to hear him speak. And, and I worked for the Labour Party, as you know, and I escorted Jeremy to, to meetings in the West Midlands as a, as a member of party staff. And I, I write in there that one of the reasons for getting Jeremy to do the forward was that I'd never met a politician before or been in the presence of a politician before who, when he met some people, they would literally cry with joy and astonishment that they'd met Jeremy Corbyn. And yet you could have someone on the other side of the road shouting, hang the bugger or he should be shot. You know, it was unbelievable. I've, I've never witnessed that in my life before, especially with a Labour politician. So there were similarities in that sense. And I did think at the time, imagine being as vilified as this, like Victor Grayson was, but not having the party machinery around you, not having party staff around you, and just being you. you know, it must be a harrowing experience. Um, you talk about how many people would have been at a Grayson meeting. 
I mean, there's some famous pictures, especially, uh, I think there's one of the unemployed on Tower Hill in 1908 or 1909. And you can see this pinprick of a guy going like that, and it's Grayson stood on the top of a, of a wagon. And there's a sea of thousands upon thousands of flat cap unemployed workers there listening to him. And there's things I mentioned in the book during his election campaign in Columbia where there's two to 3,000 people. And this is before we've got Twitter or Facebook to tell people that, you know, Victor Grayson's on his way over. They just assemble. It's incredible. Uh, to the extent that Grayson has to let a milk cart through at one point, the people will not get out of the way. So Grayson has to say, please, you know, he's not passing the Red Sea to get them through. So it's a phenomenon though, that it has rarely been seen in, in British politics. And I think that's another reason, you know, Paul mentioned jealousy. You know, you have people there that have been at it for 30, 40, 50 years, and they may be able to command 100 or 200 people. Grayson had thousands from the off, and it, the guy was a phenomenon. So we've got a question on Zoom. Why do you think Grayson was so supportive of Britain's war effort during World War I? Was it a case of being strapped for cash, or do you think he was following Blatchford, Hindman, and many others in the movement in being pro-war? Grayson came from a family of uh, servicemen. His father was a soldier, albeit a terrible one. His, uh, both of his older brothers fought in the Boer War. They both then, and they're both older than Grayson, signed up for the First World War. They weren't conscripted, they signed up. As soon as war broke out, one of them, John, was killed in the last days of the war. So this is a patriotic family, even despite the fact that Grayson's saying, well, you know, this British empire is built on the blood and sweat of the working class and we're not getting anything back from it. He still loves his country despite its ills. And he says, and I, I mentioned the quote, that we'll only be able to build socialism after the war if it's through the British system, the British parliamentary system, not under the jackboot of the Kaiser. And that's why I think he was supportive. He was very much, we need to win the war, then we can build socialism. But the, the threat of German militarism was uh, more considerable to socialism than the British parliamentary system. I mean, the guy had been elected, for goodness sake, to Parliament. There's no chance he would have been elected uh, under a German military regime. So it wasn't just for money, although he certainly used his connections to make money. He tried to sign up as soon as war broke out, like his brothers did. Um, he was a member of the government. He looks quite possibly like it was Winston Churchill that wouldn't let him sign up, but said, actually, you need to be out there on the platform, you know, encouraging people to sign up and to keep the industries working. So, um, yeah, partially for money, but there was certainly um, principles there. I've got a question from Hazel, who spoke to us about Fenner Brockway, and, and uh, she's interested in that, of course. Uh, says, very influential, but not always reliable, his, uh, yeah. Brockway's autobiography. Were there other accounts like this, or was Brockway the primary source for that myth? Well, thanks for that, Hazel. Um, yes, Brockway did idolise Hardy, and I think a lot of people his age did. Uh, and that's the problem. This, this was the generation that became the next generation of Labour MPs, which carried on that myth. Um, yes, there were others. Uh, I'm just trying to think now, you put me on the spot. Um, there was the only one that actually spoke up in defence of Grayson. And this was quite interesting because Grayson says to the newspapers a few days after his protest, that the PLP, the Parliamentary Labour Party, were fully aware of what he was about to do. And yet afterwards, none of them support this. They say, we had no idea. He did it on a whim. But there was one, there was Will Thorne, who's the, the founding father of the, the modern day GMB union, who says, I was there. Grayson told them he was going to do this process and they egged him on. They encouraged him. So, unfortunately, the majority, like Hardy, Snowden, McDonald, Bruce Glaze is another one, derided uh, Grayson and said he did it because of drink. I don't think he did. I think looking back at the newspaper articles, nothing there is written about him being drunk. Will Thorne, who was there as well, says actually this was premeditated. The evidence that we see with the anti-poverty crusade and his performance in Parliament building up to that point show it as part of um, 
you know, a serious campaign against poverty in Britain. Thank you. Right, I think we've done the questions on Zoom. I think, Ralph, did you have another another question? Yeah, I wonder if you'd say a little bit more about the very important feature of the book, which although it's a reminder of, which is the race and support of the socialists for women's suffrage and the relationship with Franco in Manchester. Uh, you say a bit more about that? Okay, uh, grace and support for women's suffrage, particularly in Manchester. Well, Grace, when he moves to Manchester from Liverpool, joins Manchester Central ILP, Independent Labour Party, which is the, um, the same constituency, if you like, the same branch as the Pankhurst family, Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst. And Sylvia Pankhurst, don't forget, she remained a socialist until her dying day. Um, Grayson, there was Keir Hardy, was very much a supporter of the suffrage movement. But if you look back to the documents and the, the meetings of the Labour Party and at Labour Party conference, the majority of the men there are saying, we don't support Mrs. Pankhurst, she's a middle class woman who is only interested in giving votes to other middle-class women, mm -hmm. actually what we should be having is universal suffrage, where all men and women over the age of 18 can vote. But Grayson was extremely supportive of the Pankhurst. There was a meeting in Manchester that uh, Hardy came to speak at, and Grayson actually supported him, and this is in 1905, I think, um, where they are supporting the Pankhurst and the, and the women's struggle. So Grayson was a rarity, actually, because there was few MPs that were as vocal on the suffrage uh, issue as Grayson was, especially socialists, because a lot of the socialist men, some of whom I mentioned that were in the SDF or ended up in the SDF, uh, were very much, no, because Mrs. Pankhurst wants the vote for herself. She doesn't want it for her servants. Uh, you know, that was their, their way of looking at it. So Grayson is quite unusual in that respect. And he's at university, of course, we discussed earlier with Christabel Pankhurst. They set up the Manchester Student Socialist Association together, uh, which is, in itself is, is worth uh, looking into. Uh, again, this has been lost. You know, a lot of this has been lost in the ether. And I think the fact that the Pankhurst, you know, Emmeline Pankhurst, mm -hmm. especially Christabel, moved very much to the right mm -hmm. after the First World War um, means that we don't tend to look at their kind of socialist uh, roots as much. And we forget very much about Richard Pankhurst as well, Emmeline's uh, husband, rooted in Manchester, friend of Keir Hardy and uh, a founder of the Labour Party. Okay, Paul. Yeah, uh, you said in the but I don't think he was a Marxist, really, was he? He was part of that ethical socialist tradition, but I think there's also a strain of anarchism in his politics, uh, including the, uh, the events of the House of Commons. But it was interesting that his background was a Bunyan, which was in any city in England, certainly, uh, he had an anarchist position. Did he buy some of that and, and bring it into his socialist beliefs? Yes, I think so. But I mean, the, the question, sorry, is, yeah, is about the anarchist tradition and did, did that come into uh, Grayson's beliefs? And Paul mentioned about, you know, Grayson not being a Marxist and I absolutely agree with that. The only bit of Marxism that Grayson seems to preach is the surplus value, the theory of surplus value, which it's kind of becomes a standard socialist fair now, which is, you know, what the, work, the, uh, what the worker is paid is probably a third of what they should be paid and everything they produce over that is surplus value which is how the capitalist makes them profits so grayson's a, a big uh, proponent of that is he an anarchist or does he have some of that liverpoolian anarchist streak in him um yes i think he does uh, he's very happy isn't he to go it alone he's not scared to go it alone now maybe that's because he's got a sea of people that are supporting him but to be from his background, he had to be tough as old boots anyway, for want of a better, better phrase. Um, and his friends in Liverpool, you know, Jim Larkin is one of his big friends in Liverpool, and I write about it in the book, 
Yeah, Larkin is again this great figure with a bit of an anarchist tendency. He's five or six years older than Grayson, but they live live near to each other. They they drink in this clarion tea shop together, because Grayson's a tea totally then, quite um, unbelievably. So yeah, and he is he's certainly influenced by the likes of Larkin. Um, so yeah, so I would agree there is a, an anarchist tendency, but I wouldn't class him as as an anarchist. He was he was too organised for that. I think perhaps we have one last question in the hall here. Yes. The clock finds evidence of some relationships with some men. Yes. And I wondered what you, you took of the sexuality of the moment of this um, research and what you thought that influenced the decision to make the site or the contributions of the research. Again, the, those quest, the, the question is, is about Grayson's sexuality. Yeah, I, I think without doubt, Grayson was bisexual. Um, there's a good argument to be made that he was gay, actually, um, but, but certainly bisexual. So there were some letters, and I think Terry uh, McCarthy is on the on the Zoom call. Um, Terry was the director of what was then, I think it was the National Labour History Museum, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, when these letters uh, came about and they were to uh, another Liverpudlian called Harry Dawson and they corresponded with the letters that exist from 1905 to 1911 and to me and to David Clark and others they were clearly having a homosexual relationship and I think these were later used against him I've mentioned in the book what Terry told me so in the sense of them influencing decisions that he made the fact they were found within the papers of Jimmy Thomas, who is a, a leading supporter of Ramsey MacDonald, shows, I think, that they were used against him. Now, do they influence decisions in his life before that? Yes, I think they do. Um, Grayson, when he's younger and in Liverpool, he sets off on a career to be a preacher. But something happens with the particular strand of uh, Christianity that he's supporting and the group he's with, where he suddenly leaves them and moves to the Unitarians. And I think if we look at the history of the Unitarian movement, it's been a much more accepting of gay people. And in fact, they were not ordaining, but kind of blessing um, gay relationships back into the 1970s, 1980s into this country, which shows you how forward thinking they are. So I, I think that that certainly influenced his, his religious shift. And there's lots of strange comments, uh, offhand comments made about Grayson, that when you put them together, they do indicate that um, he was certainly bisexual. I'll, I'll leave you with the one, probably the most famous one was Robert Blatchford. His daughter, Winifred, Winifred uh, Blatchford, was so besotted with Grayson, and him with her by all accounts, that people thought they were engaged already. And then we look back at the, we've got the letters now. David Clark saved these letters from destruction. Blatchford's letter to his daughter, where he says, I know you like Victor, I like him as well, but there's things about him that you do not understand. And he cannot be trusted. He's not the right man for you. And he makes lots of these little comments that I think looking back on it, is what we know clearly about his sexuality. <laughs> Okay, well, folks, we've covered a lot. And thank you very much for all of you who are um, asking. Oh, Elaine, are you, are, you, are you wanting to ask a, qu a question? I can try and get you to unmute. I'm not sure how well this is going to work. Okay. Oh, Am no, I that's working. Yeah, Go on. okay. Um, going back to the question of women's suffrage, I wondered if there were any connections between... Um, uh, Victor Grayson and George Lansbury, because George Lansbury is also in a re is also a rebel at that time. In that he resigns his seat um, in 1912. It's down in London though, in Bow, um, and stands on the platform of women's suffrage without any support from, as far as I'm aware, from the um, the PLP. But I wonder if you know the the sort of the Grayson the Pankhurst connection 
Sorry, is that too much? No, it's fine. No, that's um, in case people didn't hear in the in the room. Um, is it Elaine? Elaine, El yeah. El El Elaine asked about the whether there was any connection between Grace and Lansbury. Yes, there is. Um, there's documentary evidence which I, I quote in the book. Um, two things. One is that Grayson spoke at the launch of the Daily Herald, of which uh, oh. Lansbury was the the editor, and that the two did, you know, clearly have a, a relationship. Before that, Grayson's in America, and there's a guy called Joseph Fells. I think I've got that right, and he's a very wealthy man, a soap manufacturer. But he's also the proponent of a single tax, so black tax, if you like. And there's a, a telegram from Fells to Lansbury, who is also in America. And I think him and Grayson went to America together on a kind of fat farming mission, where Fells says, Grayson, in bad condition, has asked me for money. I've said no. Go and look him up. Getting bad reports. Worse for drink. So here's a guy, I and mean, we find the telegram as well from Grayson begging Fells for money because he's spent it all probably on whiskey. Um, so yes, Lansbury knows Grayson well enough to travel with him to America to speak on his behalf and for Lansbury to be asked to intervene when Grayson is clearly in a poor state. So there are connections there. But strangely, George doesn't mention uh, Victor in his autobiography. And in biographies of Lansbury, Grayson isn't mentioned. Mm. But what documentary evidence there is does suggest they knew each other very well. Yeah. Oh, good. OK, I think what this is telling me is that you all need to buy Harry's book. Uh, because <laughs> there's, there's clearly um, every, every question that is asked, he goes, yes, it's in my book. Uh, but politely has not actually been uh, been plugging it. Just give, give, just let me wave it at everybody. Pluto Press. Um, um, there is a link on our website, and uh, I would encourage you because Harry has very uh, graciously come and, and given us his time. And um, I would like to thank him very much uh, on your behalf for uh, uh, being with us today. Thank you. Very nice to have virtual and real applause together, isn't it? That's <laughs> right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's the first actual thing I've done for the book. Uh, we've had no proper launch, if you like. Uh, we're working on one at the People's History Museum in the new year, but this is the first talk I've done on it. So thank you for your patience and perseverance. Yes, thank you very much to all of you, uh, both here and, uh, and on Zoom. Uh, for your participation. So if you joined us late or if you want to recommend it to others, this talk has been recorded and will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel with a link on the event webpage. Next week's talk is online only. On Wednesday, the 29th of September at 2 p.m., we'll be welcoming Uthra Rajdrupal to talk on Grunwick strike leader Jayabin Desai. Mm -hmm. Till then, best wishes to you all in solidarity from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye. Thank you.